I have to confess, I've had a love-hate relationship with Perseverance ever since it sat down on the surface of Mars. Even though this rover touched down on the surface of the Red Planet flawlessly, and even though some of the technological demonstrations, such as the Ingenuity, for example, have proven to be amazing and have indeed even surpassed the expectations of their designers, I've still been incredibly incredibly frustrated with exactly what NASA has been trying to test on Mars. Here's the problem. In my opinion, we are trying to use technologies that really aren't suited to a planet that has an atmosphere less than 1% as dense as our own atmosphere. And this applies not only to Ingenuity, but also to the MOXIE experiment, which has, again, proven to be quite successful in converting Mars' poisonous atmosphere into breathable oxygen, but at a cost that very few people at NASA really want to talk about. And if we try to scale this stuff up in an effort to try to make it work on a larger scale for a substantial Martian colony or indeed even a small colony, we're going to find that it's too inefficient and too power consuming to be worth the effort. But there are better ways to do this. Instead of fighting the thin atmosphere of Mars, and instead of trying to draw oxygen from an atmosphere that has just too little oxygen in it, we have another alternative. There is plenty of air available in the Martian dirt, and there are ways to fly through the Martian atmosphere that don't require that we fight the nature of the planet that we're trying to fly on. How are we going to do this? Well, we're going to find all of that out in just a moment. Now look, I don't want to take anything away from Ingenuity or Moxie for that matter or its designers. What they've managed to accomplish is incredible, especially Ingenuity. The whole notion of trying to fly a helicopter on Mars is practically insane. Given the fact that the atmospheric density is about 1% of what we have at sea level here on Earth, which is the same as what kind of density we have at an altitude of 27,000 meters, which is much, much higher than we have ever attempted to fly a helicopter on this planet, the whole idea seemed a bit absurd. So in order to accomplish this, and incidentally, the density of the atmosphere gets even worse during the winter, you need a very, very light helicopter, an extremely low payload, and a crazy Crazy fast rotor. We're talking between 2400 and 2900 revolutions per minute, or about 10 times faster than a helicopter here on Earth. What does that mean? Well, it means that it can work, but it works at a cost of a tremendous amount of power. As a result, the maximum speed that you can accomplish is about 10 meters per second, which is pretty good. However, it has only achieved a maximum altitude of 12 meters. 12 meters. That's it before it's run out of power and its total length of flight, the amount of flight time that you can get out of this thing is 167 seconds per flight. And just to give you an idea of how fast these damn rotors are spinning around, it's seven tenths of the speed of sound. It's astonishing what is necessary in order to get something to fly using a helicopter in Mars's atmosphere. 
I almost never say things like this, but I am disappointed that Ingenuity performed as well as it has because, flushed with success, NASA is now planning on using four more ambitious versions of Ingenuity, and this is a dead end road. If you need a helicopter that requires 10 times the power that a normal helicopter requires in order to be able to fly, the payload that it's going to be able to carry is going to be substantially reduced. On top of that, on a planet where gasoline or petrol is not easily available, you're going to have a really hard time providing this thing with enough power to keep it going for the long run. Instead, it's going to do very short hops, recharge forever, and then do more short hops. Now, methane fuel cells or something like that might be able to provide some kind of solution, but it doesn't change the fact that we are having to fight an insanely thin atmosphere trying to duplicate a technology that is well-suited for our atmosphere, but not Mars. This, as many of you have heard me say in the past, is the solution. We work with Mars atmosphere, not against it. A properly designed Mars airship requires no power to get airborne, none whatsoever. Now granted, it's a little difficult in order to create something like this. You either need a complete vacuum inside it or a very, very low density hydrogen. But either way, you can get airborne using this kind of solution. It will require a double hulled solution, an outer shell and an inner shell in order to be be able to deal with the massive pressure differences, but aside from that, you will need no power whatsoever to go hundreds or even thousands of meters up into the Martian atmosphere and very, very little power to maneuver around the Martian atmosphere. Keep in mind, as thin as the atmosphere is, that means the wind is not going to blow something like this around very much. Instead, you use propellers that, yes, are going to have to have a very high RPM in order to push it around, but if they're not having to use so much energy in order to keep the vessel off the ground, the amount of power that you really need in order to push it around in the atmosphere is minuscule compared to the amount of energy that Ingenuity requires just to stay airborne. This is the way to carry large amounts of payload for long distances through Mars atmosphere. Work with with it, not against it. And this is something that really frustrates me. Why didn't we deploy a small scale experimental version of a motion balloon on the Perseverance as opposed to the Ingenuity helicopter? Granted, as I said, Ingenuity has done amazing things, but at the same time, it's never going to do what we need it to do. Long range reconnaissance carrying large amounts of payload and large scientific scientific packages. Ingenuity will simply never have the ability to really do that, whereas a Martian dirigible, even a small one, will be able to accomplish that. And this is something that applies to MOXIE as well. MOXIE, once again, working against the nature of Mars atmosphere as opposed to with it. As we all know, Mars atmosphere has very, very little oxygen. However, it is very rich in carbon dioxide, about 96% carbon dioxide. So what MOXIE does is it separates ox oxygen atoms rather from carbon dioxide molecules, which are made up of one carbon atom and two oxygen atoms. And then a waste product, carbon monoxide, is emitted into the Martian atmosphere. The problem isn't, of course, pollution from carbon monoxide, but at the amount of energy that is required in order to accomplish this. You you need to heat up the carbon dioxide to a temperature of 800 degrees Celsius. To accommodate this, the MOXIE unit is made with heat tolerant materials. They include nickel alloy parts, which heat and cool the gases flowing through it, and a lightweight aerogel that helps hold in the heat. And a thin gold coating on the outside of MOXIE reflects infrared heat, keeping it from radiating outward and damaging other parts of Perseverance. 
all very impressive, and Moxie got all kinds of positive press because it worked. And once again, I'm not taking anything away from that. But here's the reality that the media didn't talk about. Moxie, in its first hour of operation, only produced five grams worth of oxygen. At maximum, this thing can produce 10 grams of oxygen per hour, which is about 20 minutes worth of breathable oxygen for one astronaut. One hour of operation, 20 minutes worth of oxygen for one person. I think you see the mathematical problem with this system. Now, granted, a scaled-up version of Moxie could produce more oxygen. However, if you consider that you need triple Moxie's capabilities in order to produce enough oxygen just to sustain one astronaut, which means you need six Moxies in order to be able to produce produce rather enough oxygen for two astronauts and 12 moxies in order to produce enough oxygen for four astronauts which is the current mission size and by the way the amount of energy that it would require in order to produce enough oxygen for only two astronauts would be the same amount of energy that the average american household uses in an entire day so one day's worth of oxygen for two Two people requires the same amount of energy that a whole American household uses, which is quite a lot of energy, by the way, for one entire day. And that's just oxygen. And by the way, I'm, the reason I'm showing you an animation of a Martian habitat is to give you an idea of all the other damn stuff that you require energy for in order to be able to survive on Mars. You need to heat the habitat, for example. You also need need to run other aspects of the life support system. You also need to run all of the electronics, all of the computers, lots and lots of energy requirements to say nothing of the amount of energy it's going to require in order to take Martian ice, which is very salty and full of perchlorates, by the way, and convert it into suitable drinking water. Oh yeah, and also in situ fuel production in order to manufacture the amount of methane you're going to need for Starship to make a complete journey all the way back to Earth, the requirements are absolutely staggering. That being the case, you need to be as efficient as possible with the energy that you have at your disposal, which means you don't need wasteful pieces of technology, which unfortunately is exactly what things like Inspiration and Moxie are. It's just not going to work on a large scale with a habitat and a colony that's going to be requiring lots and lots of energy for all kinds of applications. We need more energy efficient solutions. I've already talked about using Martian dirigibles, but what do we do about oxygen? Well, there's of course the theory or the idea of extracting oxygen from Martian ice, but there's an even better way to do it. And once again, Again, I am deeply disappointed that an experiment or proof of concept of this idea was not included on Perseverance. The team that came up with this solution works at the Center of Applied Space Technology and Microgravity at the University of Bremen. And here's what they have to say, quote, At first glance, the inhospitable environment of the Red Planet seems to hold few usable resources for a life support system or or food production, but the high carbon, nitrogen containing atmosphere and red regolith soil, rich in iron and a wealth of other metals and minerals, are suitable for such bioprocesses. And the key are cyanobacteria. While on Earth they often appear as annoying blue green algae, rather, and spoil our summer bathing pleasure in the context of Mars, they can be described as masters of survival, fed with Martian dust and atmosphere, and with the capability of photosynthesis. Some microorganisms could produce oxygen and form biomass, which could serve various purposes, including food production. When humans go to Mars, we will need to provide them with large amounts of consumables, food, water, oxygen, and sometimes medication. And if our presence there is to be sustainable, all of that cannot 
not come from Earth. Yeah, that sounds exactly like the sort of reasoning that the folks who designed Moxie had to say, but here's the important difference. Cyanobacteria require very, very little energy in order to do their job. As a matter of fact, they produce their own energy. Various strains of this bacteria feed off of perchlorates and other elements in the Martian regolith and produce oxygen as a byproduct while also cleaning the regolith, that is to say removing the perchlorates and also producing nitrogen byproducts which could make the Martian regolith suitable for growing crops. Now those crops would be very, very humble to begin with, perhaps something like alfalfa. However, when you grow your alfalfa, you can then use the deteriorating plant life to make the soil even more rich until eventually you can grow whatever the hell you want to in it. And here's the kicker about cyanobacteria. There are many strains that could survive on Mars without any life support whatsoever. No heating required, no additional oxygen required for them to function. They could survive just fine. Which, of course, produces another question which I have asked before. Given that we have detected larger amounts of oxygen in the Martian atmosphere on a seasonal basis than there should be, is there a bacteria on Mars that's already doing this, just not on a very large scale? And if we were to help this bacteria along, allow it to grow more aggressively, it might be able to solve a lot of our problems for us without us having to spend a single watt of energy. But even if there is no bacteria on Mars, we could make do with whatever we could bring to the planet and it would also reproduce. We wouldn't even need to bring a large amount of it. If it had things to feed on, it would grow and it would thrive. And for those of you who say, well, we can't do that because it might contaminate the planet, well, the first step would be to make sure that you conduct the experiments in a sealed container, and then if it works, cook your samples, or you can simply use the enzymes from the bacteria themselves without actually Actually having to bring the bacteria and see if that works. The principle should work with bacteria or their enzymes. And by the way, in addition to the article that I have linked in the description that describes this solution, I also have another article that has a proof of concept life support system that would simply require an astronaut to put a few kilograms of Martian regolith into a bag, which would also hold the enzyme from certain types of perchlorate devouring bacteria and that bag would generate enough emergency oxygen for an hour without any energy expenditure whatsoever. It shocks me that considering the fact that we have known this for many years that this information has been published for some time that no proof of concept system has ever been introduced on a single Martian probe. Instead, what we're doing is introducing admittedly effective but wasteful solutions that frankly aren't going to work in the long run. That has to come to an end, and hopefully it does soon. Please smash that like, hit that subscribe, also hit that notification bell button. That's very important to my channel, and also please check the description for a variety of ways to support my content because I am traveling to Cape Canaveral day after tomorrow and could certainly use all the support I could get because I've secured an excellent place to film on private property directly opposite the pad and I'm going to get my hands on some very good equipment as well. None of that comes for free and your support would be deeply appreciated or once again, just liking and subscribing will help me a lot as well. And as always, stay angry about space!